Understanding base R, which is different from packages, right? Understanding base R is going to be uh, a key way that you navigate this language. It enables you to do things, uh, a lot of different things, that are very important. As I mentioned last time, a key aspect of any programming language is understanding what kind of input, what format, what type of input is expected for an algorithm, for a particular function, and then understanding what kind of output is going to come out of it and under what conditions. So some of those so far have been really easy. If you take like the max function, which calculates a maximum, it takes a vector as input, usually, and then it outputs a single number, right? So understanding that path is really critical because you might need to feed that maximum into another function. This is how we layer functions together, which is what we talked about last, last week. This week specifically, we talked about conditionals looping in a couple different ways and the apply family. Apply is possibly the most important of these, because the apply family of functions is really one of the most fundamental aspects of R. It under, it's how to iterate through lists, which is really how to iterate through data frames by variable. So we're going to talk about it a little, a little bit here. Uh, one other housekeeping thing, remember that there is another project assigned today, due Thursday. The length of the projects will always be about the same. There will always be about a dozen-ish things to do, like specific tasks to accomplish. Uh, like last time. So, uh, but it will, of course, utilize the different functions that we learned this week. So, uh, that should already be posted if you want to take a look at it, but we'll keep moving right now. Uh, again, are you doing this daily? Please answer this honestly for yourself. <laughs> this is an elective class. Theoretically, you're here because you know you need to learn R in order to accomplish tasks that you need in the future because you need, you think you might have a job that will require R in the future. You might even think you might have a job in the future where they're going to say, oh, you already know R. Can't you learn Python too? That's a thing people ask you when you already know a programming language. All of that means that you're doing this for you, so please treat it that way. This is not for class requirements. This is so that you learn the language. Uh, two, I'm going to talk really briefly about cheat sheets again. Three, we're going to talk about highlights from the material that was assigned for uh, today, the data camp pieces. And last, we're going to talk about uh, a little new stuff. Not very much, though. This is mostly repeat of what we've already done. The cheat sheets, this is the point where having those cheat sheets handy is going to start to become more useful uh, because they're going to remind you of the names of functions. Apply in particular is very confusing to people uh, because there's a list apply, simplified apply, v apply, etc. and they all do slightly different things. There's actually many more applies than that. Those are just the ones that got talked about in data camp. Um, so having a cheat sheet there where you can be like, oh, which one is the one that, that iterates over lists and returns something for every item in the list? Oh, that's l apply. That, that's what a cheat sheet can do for you. It's just a quick reference. Um, they're essentially flashcards. What that means is do not try to learn something from a flashcard. <laughs> if you look at a cheat sheet and something is unfamiliar completely, like you're like, I don't, I don't even remember talking about that, do not try to learn it from the cheat sheet. That will be very confusing. Uh, instead, if you've never heard of it, as long as you're in here, that probably means you don't need it and shouldn't use it. So, so don't, don't just start grabbing new functions off cheat sheets because that's going to just make it a lot harder. You're going to have to learn new stuff that we haven't covered yet and probably will cover in the future anyway. Um, when you're doing this on your own, when you, uh, after the class is over, you will find cheat sheets very useful because you will have in your head a list of a few hundred functions and you're going to mix them up a lot and having a cheat sheet available is a good way to uh, remember. All right, so new concepts. Uh, we actually started with old concepts and made them a little more complicated, which is Boolean logic. Uh, we talked about comparators last week in the less than, greater than, equality, and uh, not equals. We added greater than or equal to and, and less than or equal to. All very straightforward, I hope. In terms of uh, Boolean logic, we also, however, added these guys. The and symbol and the pipe. That's a pipe. And is and, pipe is what? Or. So the way that Boolean logic works is the same way that order of operations works mathematically, except that you're evaluating things to true or false. So as an exercise, let's see if we can do this right here. So try that for yourself. What is the answer? What does that simplify to in mathematical terms? What is the answer to 5 modulus 3? 2. Why? Yeah, we divided 5 by 3, we ended up with 2 thirds left over, 
So modulus equals 3. So now we have 9 less than 3 in parentheses plus 7. What do we do next? Mm -hmm. Always simplify all the way down. In order of operations, and and or are always last. Okay? They always occur after everything else. So if you learn PEMDAS or BIDMAS or PASS or whichever various acronym that you use, uh, always do all of those things first. So if we do 5 modulus 3, we end up with a 2 plus 7. So that means this ends up being 9. It evaluates to 9 less than 9. What does 9 less than 9 turn into? False. Is 5 greater than 9? No. What does this evaluate to? False. What is this? False. What does this ultimately become? False or false or false. So what does that equal? False. There we go. That logic is very important. Right here. Understanding what these combinations actually produce of trues and falses uh, is the, an easy way people get confused. We'll go through each of those in just a second. This first piece right here at the top, uh, don't forget to restate each as a complete comparison. This is a common rookie mistake when writing code. Uh, you might intuitively want to read this, x is greater than y and z. But that is not how the computer interprets it. Remember that and and or, pipe and, and, and the ampersand, are mathematical operators. So they are evaluated in order of operations as mathematical operators. So that means if you did this, it would first evaluate x is x greater than y true or false. Then it would evaluate is z true. So if z was a 1 or a value greater than that, it would become true. If z was a 0, it would become a false. And then it would evaluate true and false, false and false, or whatever that ends up being. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is a real common rookie mistake. Don't do it. You have to restate the full comparator statement every time. All right, so all these. Hopefully we can go through these quickly. True and false equals false. True and true equals true. False and false equals false. True or false equals Louder. True. True or true equals, and false or false equals, false. This is going to become a little more important when we get into advanced comparators, which we may or may not cover in here. We have things like exclusive ors, which changes this. We have uh, exactly equals. There's a lot of variations on comparators, but these are the ones you should definitely be familiar with for now. Again, down here. Remember that R treats true as 1 and false as 0. I mentioned that why that matters up here. When we look at y greater, x greater than y and z, z then gets evaluated on its own as a logical term. So 1, or re actually any value that exists, which is really what true means, becomes true, and 0 becomes false. So we end up using trues and falses a lot in the context of conditionals, which are these if statements. There are really two statements. Uh, they get used a little more complicated way than that, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but which are really just if and else. You also saw the construction else if, but that is not its own statement. That's really an else followed by an if. So this is not a function. What does that mean? So remember that in R, functions always have parentheses after them, like that. The reason that that's important is because I can write them without the parentheses and get the definition of the function. So this is an object in R. I can redefine it, I can move it places, I can send it input and get output. If I just type if, it doesn't do anything. It's actually waiting for more input. It will not finish that statement until I put something after that. Because if is not a function. It is a basic element of the R language, a very fundamental uh, piece of how R works. So keep that in mind. The if function evaluates whatever occurs inside parentheses following it. So it looks kind of like a function, but it's not. It evaluates what's inside parentheses after it, evaluates it to true or false, or tries to, which is important, 
and then it returns whatever comes after it only if that value is true. That's an if from a technical perspective. It evaluates a phrase, let's we'll try an example in R, if, a really easy one, true, we're going to print true. True is always true, because it is, so it's always going to do what's inside that if. If that statement is false, it skips it, which is important. It's not that it evaluates something else by default. It only does what's in there or it doesn't based on whether that's true or false. If I wanted to do something else, I need else. It's going to be a little confusing because we have this backwards. But what this function does is evaluates if false. False evaluates to false. <laughs> so as a result, it prints. Uh, it's not true. So that means that it prints false. You don't see that logic. It's flippy, but you got to think through it that way. Is false true or false? False is false. So as a result, that statement is not true. So one of the things uh, that is important to, uh, to talk about here is how these statements get evaluated. What if and else do is they evaluate the exact statement that occurs after themselves, after the comparison or after the implicit comparison. So that means you actually don't need brackets here. We can actually write this statement like that. And what will happen is that the if statement will only evaluate the next thing that occurs and then check to see if there's an else following it. Okay. We actually don't need any brackets at all, and this will still work exactly the same way. Like that. What the brackets allow is for you to put more than one statement after the if, or more than one statement after the else. It also allows you to do more complicated nesting. So say, for example, I wanted to check if something happened and then also check if something else happened. I could nest those uh, in a way like this. This kind of logical reasoning is going to be real important in certain things we do in psych in particular. Because we need to do things like check if a, a person responded in a particular way to several different pieces, but then run a set of uh, commands if they responded one way and run a different set of commands if they responded a different way. So you might have to check, for example, if uh, two or three question responses equal something and then under those conditions evaluate something else. We'll, we'll do examples of that later, but understanding how these brackets work in relation to each other, when brackets are needed and when they aren't, really important for that reason. Uh, we could, for example, here eliminate those. That changed this function, or not function, that changed the statement a little bit. Because now it, will, it would not run anything that occurs afterward. You can see that more clearly if I put something at the end. Uh, okay. Right now, this function prints both of these. It checks if true, if true, print both true, close, print other thing. If I change one of these to false, it now only prints other thing, but it prints other thing because it's inside that first if. If I change this to false, what's it going to do? Print nothing. But if I remove these brackets, what's it going to do? Remember that indentation is fake. It's purely for your readability. If I re-indent, pressing control I, it shows you what's really happening here. We pulled that outside of the if. Does that make sense to everybody? Be real careful with curly braces. It's very easy to slip something into a level you don't intend. It happens a lot. And also, hopefully, at this point, it's becoming more obvious to you why we call this development and not coding. Because troubleshooting this kind of error is a lot of what a lot of times, uh, a lot of your time will be spent doing. 
Here's an example of that. These are identical statements because there's only one statement being evaluated inside that if. Okay. Curly braces don't hurt. Removing curly braces is really a shortcut in order to make code a little more readable if you're expecting it. If you're confused, just keep all the braces in there. It doesn't hurt anything. Nested conditionals, uh, which we started a little bit in, is a little more, uh, a little complicated. You can see we have this else if in the middle. This is really, again, two statements. It's really the else statement without curly braces. What's really happening here is we're saying else, now, new statement, one line, evaluate this if. And because the if has curly braces, it extends all the way to the next else. In practice, that means that if you have a big set of conditionals, if you want to do something under this condition, do something different under this other condition, or something different under this other condition, that's when you just type else if. So if it's easier in your head to think of it as one thing, that's fine. All right. So let's try this function. I don't know if I can copy it. I'm going to pull out for a second so I can copy it. Oh boy, that looks goofy. Mm, let's see what this looks like. Just reformatting, doesn't actually do anything to the program. Okay, so here we go. First, we're gonna have to make an assignment. And the first one I said was negative five. Okay, so step by step, what happens if x, is, uh, x gets negative five, if I run this now? Step by step, what happens? What does r do? When I hit go, what will R do in order? Mm, skipping a lot of steps right there. Step one, what does this do? Checks to see if it's less than zero. What happens then? If it is less than zero, what does it do? It's still skipping steps. Don't skip steps. If this is less than zero, it evaluates this to false. This simplifies to false. Think of it mathematically. Then it says if false. Well, false is not true. Or false is true in this case. So we print negative. Or I should say this evaluates to true because it is less than zero. That was confusing, sorry. If x is less than zero, if x is less than 0, in this case we'd say negative 5 less than 0, negative 5 less than 0 evaluates to true, it says if true and then prints negative. Does it do anything here? Does it even look at this line? No. All of this is skipped. It does not exist as far as r is concerned. If we change this to 0, what happens? What does it do, step by step? Why? Tell me step, step by step what's happening. What does R do? Remember, R is the engine. Everything that you tell R, it responds in some way. So what is it doing? Yes. X is, the X is replaced with zero. Is zero less than zero? No. So this becomes false. Is this line run? This line is skipped entirely. R does not process anything occurring in there. It goes to the next line. It says else. All right, I'll do anything else. And the next statement says if. All right, let's check the next thing. What does it do? Yeah. That evaluates the false. If false, skips this entirely. End of statement, else, only run the thing that comes afterward, which is print zero. So that's what it does. Okay? You have to think like the R compiler. That's what I'm trying to get you to do here. All right. Easy one. X is 8. What happens? There we go. Skips the rest. So let's get a little more complicated. X is two quotes, which really means an empty character vector. What is this going to do? 
This is a, what you would call, a weird quirk of R. I have no good explanation for why this happens. Something that occurs in the context of R is what's called type coercion, where if, it, if a statement is expecting something but doesn't get it, it tries to convert it into something else. In this case, it's saying, is string less than zero? Well, you can't compare a string to zero because a string is non-numeric, so it converts the string into a number. And apparently, it evaluates it into something negative. Eh. This is one of the reasons why people that are programmers don't like R. Because R acts weird. It doesn't do things you expect. We could uh, try to piece this back if I tried this as numeric string. Ah, there's the answer. It returns not a number. Or not a number, it returns not, uh, it returns a missing value. And a missing value apparently is less than zero. Eh. So somewhere in the base of R, this is coded this way. This is why when you're doing this kind of coding, you need to work in the console to test stuff out before you get there. Because it's hard to kind of predict what's going to happen. So knowing that type coercion occurs, what do you think happens if I do string one? It's not a one, it's a character vector containing the number one. What do you think this will evaluate? Oh, if only it were so easy. In this case, when it coerces it, because again, this is called type coercion, when it coerces it into numeric, it says, oh, hey, there's a number in there. So it actually does convert the string one into a numeric one, which does not happen with the empty string. And you can test that again using that same function as numeric one, one. This is super useful in data cleaning. Because that means if you tell R, I'm expecting this variable to be a number and it encounters a string, it will automatically say, oh hey, that's not supposed to be there and it will convert it to a missing value for you. That's why it does that. Because again, this is built for people analyzing data sets, not people using logical reasoning, okay? It detects that, oh, it looks like a number, so we'll treat it as a number. Type coercion. Type coercion is one of your biggest enemies. Because type coercion happens, as you notice, silently. It did not tell us it did type coercion, but it did. This happens in the context of a lot of functions. And you may run a function, and you may get weird output. You're like, I don't understand why that happened. And the reason is, it did not expect the type that you sent it. It converted it invisibly, and then gave you output. That's a very common uh, early problem when people are learning programming languages that have type coercion. Not all programming languages do. Some force you to very explicitly type your variables. Uh, this one does not. Okay. You can probably guess what happens if you put a zero in. Yeah. So again, really useful for data sets. Because if, uh, in SPSS, you might have run into this problem, and it actually does this if you do this in SPSS. If you have a list of numbers, and it, when you import it from Qualtrics or whatever, it's it classifies it as uh, a string, as characters. If you convert it on that variable panel into numeric, it will just invisibly get rid of all the strings. Anything that can be converted, it'll convert. Anything it can't, it'll just drop. And it'll turn into that little dot, which is really the same as in A in R. It's a missing value. So this happens in SPSS, you just don't think about it. We have to be very explicit about it in R. Okay, loops. So we talked, uh, they talked about in Data Camp two kinds of loops. We have while loops and we have for loops. There are actually a couple other types of loops than that, uh, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on. Again, these are not functions. These are statements. While does not exist as a function you can redefine. If I try to redefine while, it won't work. That also means while is a reserved word. You can't name a variable while, just like you can't name a variable if, you can't name a variable else, and you can't name a variable for. Okay. What a while loop does is it evaluates the statement inside the parentheses as true or false, and as long as it's true, it will keep doing it. So, that leads to some situations uh, that are not so great.
What's that going to do? Yeah, it's a lowercase true. All right, real question. What's that going to do? This is an example of what's called an infinite loop. You were protected from this in data camp because data camp detects infinite loops and stops you from doing them. What happens if I do it here? I have to stop it. That is why this big old stop signs right here. We can force R to stop processing. So this is a new thing. You didn't, if you weren't dealing with RStudio, you'd never had to deal with that. But if you get yourself, yourself caught in an infinite loop, one of two things will happen. One, it will be uh, what's called a memory leak error, and R will crash. The whole RStudio will crash. Or it will just keep doing it, whatever it's doing, and uh, uh, you'll have to stop it manually. The things that cause our studio to crash is where you keep creating new things. So if I had a while loop, for example, where in every case, a brand new variable was added to a data frame, you see the problem. Eventually, that data frame will get huge because it adds a new, it adds a new uh, column every time. So as a result of that, our studio will eventually say, I don't know how to interpret this. It's too big, and the whole program will crash. In this case, that doesn't happen because all it's doing is printing output to the console. But one of those two things will happen. A very important reason to save a lot <laughs> in our studio, especially when you're dealing with loops, uh, and also to use Git to make sure you have backup versions of, uh, your, of your files. Uh, four is kind of a weird one. Four is uh, also a looping variable. In most languages, four is called for each. It is not called for. Four is a totally different thing in most other languages. Um, a much more useful thing, actually. The four version, uh, the version of four used inside uh, R, basically says take a create a new variable for each value inside a vector. So in this case, uh, we could say four i in one through ten. Print i. What will that do? For now, one through ten. Do I need curly braces in this case? No. Same logic as before. It's one line, so you don't actually have to have them. What is happening in this statement, step by step? You can walk me through this one. Creates a numeric vector of values 1 through 10. I could also use the SEQ function sequence. I could use the sequence function, which we covered in data camp. I could also use the rep function. I could also just pass a variable in. Doesn't matter. You can do all of those things. All it's expecting is a vector. For each value in that vector, then, what does it do? Assigns it to i. There's an implicit assignment operator here. i gets 1, i gets 2, i gets 3. That's going to happen one by one every time. And then it's just going to print the value of i at that point. But keep that order in your head. It's not just that, oh, it just prints out 1 through 10. It's that it creates a numeric vector from 1 through 10. It assigns each of those values to i one at a time, and it executes whatever comes after it, in this case, print. So process-wise, that means this does create numeric vector. Look at first I element in numeric vector equals 1. Assign 1 to i. Run statement print i where i equals 1. Repeat. Assign, look at uh, vector position 2. Vector position 2 contains the number 2. Assign that value to i, print that value. That's what's happening in sequence. Don't simplify it. Don't simplify in your head. Think really carefully about what r is actually doing when you do this. We learned, uh, we'll stay over here. We learned about break and next. Break is a way to break out of a loop, and next is a way to cut to the next iteration of the loop. Don't use them. In general, it is not a good idea to use next and break. Uh, you can if you really have to, but usually if you find you need one of those things, you haven't written the loop correctly. So try to avoid using them. We will not, I, I can't think of even one situation in actually doing research where I needed to do that. So uh, it's just good code practice to write loops that don't need to break out of themselves. Uh, it's much better to, to layer in conditionals or whatever else you might need. Uh, curly braces are also uh, optional. I mentioned that before. Oh, we can see another example with this one. While x is less than 10, print x gets x plus 1. 
Mm, it's a new construction. Why can I do that? Why does this work? When you do, oops, when you do, and if, when you perform an assignment operator, you're actually returning the value being assigned. So what's happening here, in order, very important, in order, first it checks, is x less than 10? In this case, I just assigned it to zero, so this evaluates to true, so we do what comes next. Then it says print. But in order to print, it needs a return value from what's inside print, because print is a function. Inside this function, x gets x plus 1. Well, x is currently equal to 0, so 0 plus 1 equals 1, and then assign that value to x, 1. That entire expression simplifies to 1, which then becomes the parameter to the function print, so it prints 1. If we run it, you can see that happen. And once again, up here, x has now become 10. Okay? You have to evaluate everything step by step. Do not skip. And again, this is the difference between being kind of a technician of the language and having survival phrases versus actually understanding what's happening. So if you just learn, uh, oh, I use while statements to make loops, then you lose this detail. Very important. Okay? All right. Nested functions. We actually used some of these last week. Uh, we're going to use a few more now. It's going to become more and more important to nest functions in the way that we just talked about. This, uh, this print is really a nested function that we covered in the last slide because we really have an assignment function going on. The assignment operator is used to assign values and return a value, and that's being fed into print. That's how these nested functions work. The output of functions is called a return. You wrote some functions in DataCamp that you designed the return, essentially, that those functions were going to spit back out, right? So understanding how these returns end up converting over into the input of other functions, really important. Say that you wanted to uh, do this. I need to store the mean of two variables in a list because some function that you need later requires a list of two variables. Or a list of two means, I should say. The way you should do it the way you develop code, not the way you write code, the way you develop code is to start in the innermost problem. When you say, well, first, I need to get the mean of two different values. So in the console, you would run mean x, mean y, make sure they work. Are these functional statements? And once you're confident those two functions work, you can add them into as parameters of the larger function. So now we're running mean x, mean y, and feeding them as parameters to list. Well, now we need to store that we first we run this and make sure we actually get a list of two means in the console. And once that works, we add in the full statement and copy this up to the script. That's how you develop code. Don't just automatically say, all right, I need to do like three or four things all in one statement and just try to bang it out. Like, don't do that. You will get very frustrated doing that. So instead, piece by piece, deconstruct the problem into all the component parts and then execute those component parts piece by piece, until you can build the final statement. Make sense? Is this thinking like a developer? Okay. Actually, writing functions, you can design them in a lot of different ways. Uh, you are going to need to write a number of functions in R. Uh, this is not something you can avoid. Basic process, the basic kind of parameters, or basic setup you use right, is right here. The name of the function that you want to define gets the, name, uh, the word function and then the parameters. If you just put in a parameter without uh, a, a, another gets uh, operator, then the parameter is going to be required. The person who writes this, the name of this function is going to have to write in a number or a character or whatever that is in order to fill that parameter. If you have a gets symbol, then it becomes a default. So if the person writing a function doesn't do that, then they are going to have to, uh, they're going to be, you're going to be using that value five inside it no matter what. So to check if you understand how that works, I'm going to copy this into script. There's a function. And let's try a few things. If I press enter right now, what happens? Oh, 
not an error. Mm. This is a function. That means you can you can look at what the function equals by typing it. Because functions are objects in R that you can look at, right? So in the, in the same way that I can't just type if because it's a statement, add one is a function, so that means I can look at it. Okay. So what happens if I do that? What's it going to return? An error. Why? There's no assignment for x. What will happen inside this function is it's going to look, are all required parameters present? No, send error. So if I do that, error and add one, argument x is missing. Okay? So straightforward so far. What happens if I do add one, one? What's that going to do? Piece by piece. It's going to check for a value of x. Yes, there's an x value 1, so x becomes 1. Check for a value of y. There is no second parameter for y, so therefore y equals 1. And it's going to add 1 and 1 inside these parentheses, return 2, and then return that value as the, as the output. And that's going to coerce into a numeric vector with one value. That's what got returned there. Okay. So what happens if I do that? Mm -hmm. Process. This value is x, so it goes into 1. This value is the second term, so it becomes y. So return those added together and get 4. What happens if I do that? Actually, let's go to the whole hog. What happens if I do that? Still 4. What happens if I do that? Still four. What happens if I do that? That's a weird R thing. What's happening is it sees that this is the Y parameter. It goes ahead and puts it up into the function where Y is defined. And then it says, of the remaining parameters, let's put these in order that they're given. What happens if I do that? Oh, man. Any named parameter gets sent first. Anytime you name a parameter in an R function, it sends that back to the function first every time, regardless of order. Let's see if we get real tricky. I think that does. It worked. Why did it work? Again, it passes the parameter first. So what it does, and then it may be easier if we look at the uh, function definition while we're doing this. What it's doing is it's saying, well, let's look at named parameters first. X gets three is right there. So the X gets filled in with three. Then it says, of remaining parameters in the order they're specified, let's use the remaining numbers we have to fill them in. So it says x equals 3, all right, that gets filled up. Now we have one parameter remaining, and we have one parameter that's not assigned to a particular value, so that gets fed in. That's the way R processes parameters. It's very strange. In other languages, that doesn't work. You have to put them in order, and you put blanks between commas and that kind of thing. So this is a specifically an R thing. But remember, it happens. Because you will see, especially once you start looking at... Um, Especially once you start looking at code on the internet, people take advantage of this in weird ways. So if a function takes, for example, eight parameters, they may name a couple of them and then just add the rest at the end. And you'll look at it and you'll say, I don't understand how these numbers map into the documentation I have. And the reason is because of this, the way, the order that it evaluates parameters, named first, then in order. Okay. Worry about scoping. Variable scoping is something that confuses a lot of folks. 
Variables only exist inside the functions where they're defined. So we will go back over to R. And there we go. In this, you might have noticed I used the number X, the letter X as my variable name. Did this X change? No. This is called scoping. Variable scoping means that anything defined or used inside a function only exists inside that function. Okay? If I define any variable inside of this, it doesn't matter. It only applies inside it. You can think of this as a black box. This is a, it's an algorithm. You pass input into it through these parameters right here, and you pull output out of it via its return function. Everything that happens between those two points is an encapsulated box. Nothing gets in or out unless you tell it to. Make sense? So this X and this Y only exist as long as this function is being run, and then they are eliminated. And on top of that, they exist in a different, what's called namespace, than these. So even though they're instantiated inside the function, they don't replace the variables you already have. So it's not like the while loop where it just does stuff and the x changes each time. If you did a while loop inside this, it would only change the x inside the function, and then whatever got returned would pull them out of it, but that x up there would not change. Okay? Make sense to everybody? Worry about scoping. Very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Black box. It would only change X if this returned X and then you assigned it to X. You can only pass information in through parameters. You can only pull information out through return functions. That's it. End of story. Nothing else you do in there applies in the real world, so to speak. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I add 1 and then add, apply that value to x, then that will change this x. Yeah. But that's because I've assigned that return value. So this can lead to some really confusing code. Because say, for example, someone assigned a value to x, and then they applied a function that has an x in it, and then they kept manipulating x at the end, if you don't keep this straight, you'll be you'll think, well, wait a minute, all this stuff happened. Why didn't X change? This is the reason. Variable scoping. Okay. Okay. There are also anonymous functions, variables with no name. I hope you get that reference. Anybody? Only a couple in the back. Uh, that is a very young Clint Eastwood, by the way. The man with no name. Good, bad, and the ugly. You know, that's eh, fine. Anyway, function with no name uh, is an anonymous function. The value of an anonymous function is that you can pass it as a parameter itself. This is especially valuable in the context of lapply or the apply family, because that means you can write a function that only exists while the apply is being used. We're not going to get too much into this yet, because this is a more complicated kind of advanced sort of thing. Uh, we will get to it later. But for now, just know that this happens. If you see a function, if you see the command function parameters get something, but it doesn't get assigned to a variable, that's an anonymous function. That's what that's called. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into details of this later, so don't, don't worry too much about it yet. Packages. Uh, as I mentioned two weeks ago, all of the material in, or all of the functions that you might randomly need in R are available in packages, which are created by random people that contribute to the open source community surrounding R. Uh, they are vetted or not vetted, uh, depending on what they are. Uh, but if you need to have specific functionality that's not in quote unquote base R, which is what we're learning about now, then you need a package. So the way that you install packages is these two pieces, install that packages and library. Install that packages always takes character vectors as a parameter, because again, this is a function. It always takes strings. You always need quotes. So that's something people get confused about. You need quotes on install that packages. On library, you can or use quotes or you can choose not to use quotes. It doesn't matter. Because at that point, after you've installed the package, the name of that package exists in R, so you can refer to it without quotes if you want the technical version. We're going to use a lot of packages. Uh, everyone is different. Everyone provides different capabilities. 
Uh, we are not going to learn any one package exhaustively, except maybe dplyr. We're going to learn a lot about dplyr. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, most functions we're going to dip into just for a few functions. So, uh, for example, if you want to do machine learning, I'm not going to teach you the whole machine learning packages that are available, uh, but I teach you how to do some machine learning within those packages. That should make sense. So yeah, again, all of this is uh, from the open source community, uh, people that just believe, oh, hey, there should really be a set of functions for this. For example, there's a package called Psych, and what it does is it allows you to calculate uh, mean scores uh, given scoring keys pretty easily. So say, for example, you had a knowledge test or a cognitive ability test or something with else with right and wrong answers, and certain answers were weighted 2 or 1 or negative 1 or whatever. Well, normally in R, you would have to write a huge function for all of those individual pieces one by one. The psych package has a, a function inside it where you can create a matrix that just shows all the weights, and you can feed it the matrix of weights, the actual values, and it just creates scores. So it's a lot easier to use than do it yourself. So we'll explore a lot of examples of that kind of thing. Uh, there are also groups of people that bind to, that, that kind of agree informally, sometimes formally, to create what are called frameworks. And what a framework is, is a collection of packages that all share sort of the same underlying assumptions. So dplyr is an example of a framework called the tidyverse, which we will learn a lot about in here, uh, which is a whole system of understanding how to manipulate data in a way that is way more intuitive than base R. We're still learning base R, you'll note, because if it's not in the tidyverse, you still have to do it this way. But you will find a lot of the stuff that we're going to do over the next few weeks, once we learn the tidyverse, is going to become a lot easier. So that's an example of the kind of thing, that, the kind of place that we're moving. But remember these statements for now. Once you install that packages on your computer, it is installed forever until you physically delete it from the system. So you only need to do that one time. You can do it in the console. Don't write it into a script. Uh, but library, you have to call every time. So, for example, if I wanted to install dplyr, I would do it like that. What it does is it hunts in CRAN, and remember CRAN is the comprehensive uh, R archive network, that website that has R packages. It looks in CRAN for the name of the thing you just told it, it goes and downloads it for you, and it installs it somewhere on your computer, all automatically. Once that exists, and the internet connection is not very fast in here, so I should not have done that. That's okay. Once, the, uh, once that is done, it will do everything that depends on it, because sometimes other packages depend on it. That's, that's that framework example I was talking about. It will do all of that stuff and tell you, great, you're good now. But I still at this point can't access functions inside dplyr unless I use the library function first. So if I do library dplyr, now I have access to all of the stuff inside dplyr. Okay. So you'll uh, do a little about that in this week's project, I think. Uh, you'll need a package that you don't have. Uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll become very familiar with that in the next few weeks. All right. Now we get to the apply family. Again, I mentioned before that the apply family is one of the... Uh, most R-like aspects of R. It's very uniquely an R thing for reasons that we don't need to get into. In other languages, you don't do it this way. This is a weird R thing. Uh, because R is really organized around the concept of data frames, around data sets and vectors. When you have a data frame, if you need to do something in every piece of that data frame, every uh, variable in that data frame, you will probably use an apply function. Specifically, you'll use lapply, which means list apply. What list apply is takes an input of a list and it does something where the first parameter of the function is always the name of that list. So for example, uh, I uh, added a function up here that we're going to use, uh, which I find really useful. Uh, just very briefly, this is an aside. What this function at the top does is it creates a normal distribution of 50 variables, a mean of 3, a standard deviation of 1. It puts those into a matrix of shape 5 column and 10 row, and then it converts it to a data frame. That allows me to very quickly generate a data set that looks an awful lot like psychological responses. 
Okay. Normally distributed, I mean, they're uncorrelated, obviously, uh, because I didn't tell it to correlate them. But, yeah, creates 10 normally distributed cases across five variables. And we're, we're going to use that kind of data generation approach in a lot of different examples. So I just want you to be aware of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So say for every line of this data set that I wanted to, or for every variable in this data set, I wanted to calculate a mean. How could you do that? You already have one approach, right? Well, what's the rest of what I'm typing right now? Mm -hmm. Summary function. And that'll give me means, etc. But what if I just need the means? Alone. Because they need to be the input of some other function. What do I do? So this is where L apply becomes important. What this function does, and I'll show you the means right there. What this function does is it takes this input data frame, which is a list. Remember, a data frame is a list that acts like a matrix. It takes this input data frame, it goes item by item in the list, and it applies the function mean with the list, uh, the list variable as the item, as the first term of mean. So what this is doing is saying, List apply test df mean, aha, convert that into one statement per variable, in this case five, and then it says mean of variable one, mean of variable two, mean of variable three, mean of variable four, mean of variable five. That produces this over here, a list of five means. See how that worked? Yeah. You would not use apply. If you wanted the mean uh, by row, then you're just doing basic vector manipulation. Because again, remember that, um, remember it's a list that acts like a matrix. So because it acts like a matrix, you can use row mean, the function, in order to get that. Or alternatively, you could create a new variable equal to the mean of various items, a lot of different things you can do. Okay? Now this is a list. So that means we have to worry about components and subsets and all sorts of nonsense. What if we wanted this to just be a vector? How would I change this statement over here? Burp. Remember that S apply is simple apply. It's an L apply, but it coerces the list down to the simplest possible format. There's a whole string of exercises in data camp about this. So when you use list apply, L apply, it always returns a list. It processes a list and returns a list. S apply processes a list, but converts it down as far as it can. And in this case, we ended up with a named numeric vector right here. Let me see the difference. That's it. That's the only difference between S apply and L apply. S apply says, wait a minute. You have a list of single numbers. You don't need a list of single numbers. That can be expressed as a vector, so it simplifies. It down converts it for you. But that means that this is identical to another nested function. If I did as dot, I think as dot vector works. Yeah, it does the same thing. It should. Oh, no, it won't. I have to do unlist, I think. Yeah. So you can do this conversion yourself if you want, but s apply is just a, a easier to read version of this because instead of having two nested functions, we just have the one. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as vector will convert a single part of a matrix into a vector. Uh, it will also convert. It's also useful in some character contexts if you're trying to reconvert a multi-part character vector into a simple vector. But yeah. I don't know that vector actually used as vector myself. Okay. So, yeah. So that's L apply and S apply. You can see a, a difference here, too. 
In this case, I'm using to lower, which is a function that changes everything in a character vector to lowercase. Lowercase underscore v gets to lower string v converts a single string vector into lowercase characters. But if I had a list of vectors, a data set containing such vectors, then I couldn't do that because to lower expects a vector, expects characters. So you can't feed it a list. So in that case, you have to convert it to Lplot. Anybody see? So this is where, again, understanding precisely what kind of data format any given function is expecting and outputs is important. To lower expects a vector and outputs a vector. So if you're going to feed it a vector, that's fine. If you need to feed it vectors inside a list, then you're going to have to use L apply. See the difference? And again, if you forget what things take, you can always go back to this guy. Uh, if we look at to lower, for example, down here in the help viewer, you're going to see transfers characters and character vectors. Arguments of that character vector, value a character vector. So that means you cannot feed a list to this function. Okay? Everything's related to everything else. Okay? okay. You also learn about v apply, uh, which I think is volatile. I'm not sure what the v is. This function allows you to pre specify what format comes back to an s apply. Uh, remember that an s apply will try to simplify if it can. So it'll convert, for example, a list into a matrix or a list into a vector if possible. And otherwise, it won't. <laughs> so if the format that it gets passed is not what it expects, then it won't downconvert it. And it, but it won't throw an error either. It's that kind of invisible thing that R does. So v apply allows you to pre-specify what comes back. This is most useful if you go into full-blown true data science where you have uh, volatile data coming in constantly and the output of that is not in your control. So say, for example, you wrote a web application where you were getting data from Qualtrics in real time and then outputting that to like a display summary. That kind of thing happens in I.O. in the context of performance evaluations or uh, uh, feedback. So like somebody fills out surveys and you want to give managers output immediately. Well, if that screws up somehow, like if you get invalid input, then it's still going to try to interpret that as a number because of all the type coercion weirdness that R does. And you might end up giving managers incorrect information. But if you use vapply, you can catch it. So if it's vapply and it says, I'm expecting a vector, and then it doesn't get a vector, it'll throw an error. And then instead of the manager getting an inaccurate report, they won't get any report at all. So that, that's what vapply is usually used for, is that kind of like safeguard. So we won't use it in here at all. <laughs> so you don't really need to worry about vapply. Um, but sapply and lapply, we definitely do. All right, regular expressions. You learn, uh, sometimes called regex, you learn a little bit about grep, which is the ability to use a regex pattern within a character vector and return either true or false, yes, it found that, or the location of it. This is uh, an example. We had agreements uh, gets vector of yes, no, yes. If you run grepl, it'll return true, false, trues and falses based on whether or not it finds the word yes inside yes. Uh, or if you do it as grep, you'll find the character points. So item one and item three get returned because they match true. These kind of uh, operations are super useful in data cleaning. When you need to specifically spot, for example, uh, in a given response, did a person use a certain word? In a given response uh, to a survey, uh, show me all of the rows in which people talked about satisfaction or all the rows in which people talked about their boss. You can use grep to do that kind of thing. What do you think this does? This is a regex expression. Any guesses as to what this means? You only actually learned about a few of those pieces, so you have to guess at some of them. This just means the start, and this just means the end. This means repeats three times. This means a range. The backslash here means this is literally a parenthesis. And I bet you can guess what the pipe means based on today. And the brackets mean any value between these numbers. What do you think this evaluates to?
phone numbers. This is a U.S. phone number in regex. It looks for, are there parentheses surrounding three numbers range 0 through 9 and a space, or does it find three numbers followed by a dash? Then three numbers, 0 through 9, another dash, four numbers, 0 through 9. So this matches phone numbers in some formats. Don't ever write that. There are libraries of regex expressions on the internet for any random thing you might want. You may need to write your own for certain situations, but most of the time if you're doing something complicated, like I need to find email addresses in uh, a text box, somebody already did that, and you don't need to. We're going to talk about this a lot more later, because this kind of parsing is really important for uh, web scraping, which we'll cover in here. Uh, so we'll come back to grep and character processing like this later. Don't worry too much about it now except to know that it exists, and that's what grep does. Dates and time. This is a little bit more uh, complicated. And actually, I'm going to check on progress right here. Oh, uh, we got a little ways to go. A little faster. So sys.date and sys.time, and note that date is capitalized and time isn't. Returns date and time. You're probably not going to actually need sys.date very much. In most cases, you use sys.time because you want to assess uh, the time that somebody completed or started a survey. That's a, the most common kind of application we'll see. Uh, sys.time returns the number of seconds since the Unix epoch. This is a universal concept in programming. The universal epic, epic uh, the Unix epic, is January 1st, 1970 in a universal time, universal coordinated time, UTC, which is for all intents and purposes the same as Greenwich Mean Time, which is like an hour west of London. Okay? All time on computers is based on that number. The reason for that is because it allows you to calculate the difference in seconds between anything that ever happens anywhere on Earth regardless of time zone, regardless of the way they record dates there, regardless of any other information, and return it as number of seconds. So if we go to uh, sys dot, sys dot time, we get this guy. We do unclass, we get the Unix epic. So it has been 1,505,227,262 seconds since January 1st, 1970, Universal uh, at 00, zero midnight, Universal Coordinated Time. If I keep running that, you will see that it updates as we go. This number, if you're in Ukraine, US, South Africa, wherever, doesn't matter. This time, time is always the same, because this is always based on one time zone in the entire world. So that's the advantage. If you have people, if you have people completing the assessment in different time zones, you might end up getting different times with different time zones and trying to manually figure out all of that is just a horrible nightmare. So instead we use the Unix epic. And the advantage to doing that is that you can literally subtract times. If you have the Unix epic here and the Unix epic here, you say, oh hey, you took 23 seconds to complete the assessment. And it's very straightforward. Regardless of whether it's the next day or whatever else. The format that you saw first in R is called a POSIX format, which you also talked about in Data Camp, this guy, which is always uh, year dash month dash day space hour colon second or minute colon second and with both characters. POSIX is a format you should also get very familiar with because you will use that a lot too. Uh, but that's more for human readability not for doing stuff with. Uh, note that I used unclass as a way to convert the POSIX format into a Unix epic. Okay, and Converting back and forth between POSIX and, epic and Unix time very common problem and will be a major part of your project. Yeah, you can also use as numeric. Uh, the difference between unclass and as numeric uh, is not always obvious. Sometimes unclass will return a list and sometimes it won't, depending on a variety of factors. Very briefly, these are just to make sure you remember these. They all take one argument, so they're except for round, so they're all pretty straightforward. Uh, means, standard deviations, absolute values, rounding, minimums, and maximums. Uh, you might need those in various situations. Data functions, uh, SEQ is for sequencing numbers. Uh, so if you need to have one through 10, but skipping every other number, you can do that kind of thing with sequence. Uh, sort, sorts, length gives you the length of a character vector. Incar is the number of characters in a character vector. 
Uh, identical, check to see if two things are the same. STR is the structure of a variable. Type of shows type. I, I demonstrated uh, as several times. That's to explicitly do type coercions. So if you need to convert something from a data frame into a matrix or whatever else you might want. And I showed you on list as well. This guy right here is not a function, but you'll see a lot. Uh, it's a common parameter in uh, database functions, database functions that, that demonstrates what you do with missing values. So do I remove NA characters? I constantly flip this in my head and think it's rm.na. I will probably do it in here multiple times, but it's na.rm. So you'll see a function that has like na.rm equals true. That means remove missing values before doing this. That's all that means. 